Hi everyone. So I was just reading this scripture and I came across uh, Jesus talking about Herod and it's in Mark 8 verse 14 through to 21, the leaven of the Pharisees and Herod. It says, Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread, neither had they in their ship with them more than one loaf. And he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have no bread. And when Jesus knew it, he saith unto them, Why reason ye because ye have no bread? Perceive ye not yet, neither understand. Have ye your heart yet hardened? Having eyes, see ye not. Having ears, hear ye not. And do ye not remember, when I break the five loaves among the five thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took ye up? They say unto him, Twelve. And when the seven among four thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took ye up? And they said, Seven. And he said unto them, How is it that ye do not understand? So, you know, Jesus is referring to the loaves and the fishes here, how you know, they broke one loaf of bread and they fed 5,000. And when we go to the meaning of leaven in the Bible, so there's a few instances where leaven is spoken of. So uh, this is from Bible study tool. It says leaven in the New Testament. The noun for leaven is zume and the verb for leaven is zumo. The noun occurs 11 times and the verb four times. There are, however, really only three distinct uses of leaven in the New Testament. The first occurrence is the parable of the leaven, and that's in Matthew 13, 33 and Luke 13, 20 to 21. This parable teaches that the reign of God is like what happens when leaven permeates a batch of dough. Jesus' point is that the small, insignificant beginnings of God's reign in himself will one day be great. Although the parable does not describe how this will happen, it alludes to Jesus' future reign as the Son of Man. So Matthew 33, it says, He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast, or leaven, that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. So we'll read the chapter so here in Matthew 13, it's the parable of the mustard seed and the yeast. I don't know what edition this is, but it says, He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seed, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast or leaven that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. Now, it's interesting that um, just before... The parable of the leaven is the parable of the weeds or the tares. It says, Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servant came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burnt. Then gather the wheat and bring them to my barn. So down after the parable of the leaven, the weeds are explained and it says, then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. 
The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. So who are the people of the kingdom? You know, they're the uh, the children of Jacob. The weeds are the people of the evil one. And who are the people of the evil one? They are the seed of the serpent. And the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. So this is referring to Revelation, the end of the age. And the harvesters are angels or messengers. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. So when we go to Leviticus, we've got the parable of the first fruits. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I give you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. And he shall wave the sheep before the Lord to be accepted on your behalf. On the day of the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And you shall offer on that day when you have the sheaf a male lamb of the first year. Okay, this is referring to the Lamb of God, Jesus. Without blemish as a burnt offering to the Lord. Its grain offering shall be two tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil. An offering made by fire to the Lord for a sweet aroma and its drink offering shall be wine one fourth of him. So this is the Passover meal. You shall eat neither bread nor parched grain nor fresh grain until the same day that you have brought an offering to your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. In Corinthians 15, 20 to 22, Paul says, the last enemy destroyed, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Jesus was the first fruits, as Paul calls him the second Adam. So the resurrection is and the new spiritual body that we receive in the resurrection is a new creation you know we become a new creation and that's pretty much what jesus came to do to be a new creation and the first fruits of that new kingdom so i find it kind of interesting that in uh, mark 8 you know jesus is referring to the loaves and the leaven and basically we have the the sheath or the first fruits of the harvest it says you shall neither eat neither bread nor parched grain nor fresh grain until the same day that you have brought an offering to your god and the offering was the male lamb or jesus of the first the male lamb of the first year without blemish as a burnt offering to the lord i'm not really talking about that in particular what I am referring to here is the leaven. And, you know, as it says here, the first of leaven is the parable of the woman who adds leaven to her bread. That the kingdom of heaven is like the leaven and it worked through the dough and basically it made the dough rise and increase. We've got the parable of the, uh, the loaves that... By one loaf, uh, Jesus has increased to feed 5,000. And this is like the kingdom of heaven. So all other occurrences of leaven in the Bible are a warning. Second occurrence of leaven is Jesus warning to his disciples in Matthew 16, 5 to 12, and Mark 8, 15. And present Jesus warning following the Pharisees, questioning of Jesus about a sign from heaven. After Jesus' curt statement that no sign will be given to this generation, he and his disciples sail across the Sea of Galilee. In the boat, Jesus warns them about the leaven, really meaning the attitude or perspective of the Pharisees and Herod. So 
is this referring to Herod and the Pharisees having the same agenda and the same spiritual and religious doctrine that they were a leaven uh, in a bad sense? In the ensuring discussion, it is apparent that the attitude that Jesus is warning about is the blindness towards his identity as the Messiah. He's, he repeatedly asks him, do you still understand? It says, and significantly after Jesus performs a second remarkable process, miracle of Jesus healing the blind man, Peter finally confesses that Jesus is the Messiah. For Mark, then, leaven stands for object refusal to perceive that Jesus is the Messiah. Well, this is that this person's opinion on that, but when we look at the first parable of Matthew 13, and directly after that we have the parable of the wheat and the tares. And it's ironic that at this time of history in Judea we've got the Pharisees and Herod and we have the Israelites and Jesus is taking his message to, to the Israelites, to the children of Jacob. And so we have this system happening in Judea at this time where we've got these Idumean converts and we've got the Israelites who are left in the kingdom of Judea. Uh, eventually the apostles go out to the lost tribes in the nations and they're brought back together. And so what Jesus is saying here, in my opinion, from what I can see, is that there is the leaven of the kingdom, which the kingdom will grow uh, to a much greater portion. But there's also the kingdom of the Pharisees and of Herod. There's the wheat first fruits offering who are the children of Israel or the children of Jacob. And there is the tares who are planted by the devil or they are the serpent seed, which Jesus calls the Pharisees. And so is this saying that the Pharisees and Herod were Idumean converts? If we look up the Strong's Concordance word etymology of Pharisee, it tells us that it's a masculine uh, a member of a Jewish religious sect, Pharisaeus, probably a separatist, a purist, a Pharisee. Now, you would consider this now in modern terms like the um, well, a Puritan or, or even like someone who is very dogmatic and you must follow the law to the T. That's the impression you get from this interpretation. A purist, someone who's forcing their laws and dogmas onto the people. But if we look at in it in the light of, you know, there were two specific groups, there were two specific kingdoms going on in Judea at the time, the kingdom of Esau, the Egemeans, and the kingdom of Jacob, the Israelites. And we have two separate religious doctrines, that of the Pharisees and that of Herod. So when we go to the Hebrew word parash, it says um, scatter. Verb parash, porash, to make distinct, declare. Strong's exhaustive concordance, to scatter, declare, distinctly show, sting. You know, the sting of the, the scorpion. Scatter, why are they scattering? You know, like, is this like the tears amongst the wheat? Primitive root, to separate, literally to disperse or figuratively to specify, also by implication, to wound, scatter, declare, distinctly show, sting. So when the Revelation talks about the scorpions, the tails, you know, is that talking about the sting of the Pharisees or the, the sting of the doctrine of the Pharisees? If we go back to the third uh, use of leaven, it says Matthew 16, 1 to 6, presents Jesus' warning in the same context as Mark, but brings out some distinctive nuances. Matthew records that Jesus' response to the questioning of the Pharisees and Sadducees includes some symbolic discussion about weather and a reference to the sign of Jonah. Then in the following discussion with the disciples after they have reached the other side, Jesus warns against the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. 
Matthew clarifies with Jesus' statement that the disciples finally understood that Jesus was referring to the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So what were they teaching? You know, they, they weren't teaching Torah, obviously. They were teaching something else. And, you know, if Jesus is linking them to Herod, what religious teaching were they teaching? Was it the the religion of the Idumean people? You know, and when we go to Idumea, they were preaching a very basically a uh, what could be considered a Roman Catholic doctrine of Trinity and of they were basically worshiping Zeus, a, a Zeus, a form of Zeus, and um, so this was a Babylonian mystery religion. And as I've said in my other videos, I believe that the Nabataeans and the Idumeans who united prior to the Idumean conversion by the Maccabees, that they were the nomadic people of Nebu from the same people who the King Nebuchadnezzar came from. They were a nomadic people in Iraq. It says the way Matthew presents the whole scene with the explicit use of teaching in verses 12 seems to focus the meaning of leaven in his gospel on the attitude of the rejection of Jesus by the Pharisees and Sadducees. The meaning is essentially the same as in Mark. Mark's sensitivity to the struggle of the disciples to perceive Jesus' identity as symbolized in the two process miracle is not present in Matthew. So Luke presents Jesus' warning about leaven in the context of his large central section on Jesus' teaching journey to Jerusalem. He has just narrated Jesus' worries on the Pharisees and scribes and now describes the gathering of a large crowd. Jesus warns his disciples against the leaven of the Pharisees, which Luke notes is hypocrisy. And then we have uh, Paul talking about leaven in the New Testament is found in Paul's letters in what is probably the earliest letter Paul cites the proverbial statement a little leaven or yeast works through the whole batch of dough so a little bit of false Edomite doctrine will leaven the whole batch of wheat or the the first fruits now this kind of reminds me of what happened in early Christianity we have these first fruits the the uh, children of Jacob and we have Jesus, the, the lamb offering, and what happens is, you know, this dragon goes after the woman as she flees into the wilderness where basically it spews forth its water or its doctrine. And we have a little bit of this doctrine in the batch. And before we know it, we have what we know today is the Roman Catholic Church and its Trinity doctrine and its... Um, Babylonian mystery religion, sun worship, which is what was going on in Nabatea and Idumea at that time. And Paul says, this proverb, this proverb is intended by Paul to cause the Galatians to expel the dangerous Judaizers from their churches. Leaven here symbolizes wrong teaching that destroys true Christianity. Now, what are the Judaizers? You know, like if Paul is... Uh, they're teaching Christianity, true Christianity or the message from Jesus, and they've got Judaizers in the church. Now, this, a lot of these people were from Judea. They were Israelites, so they knew the Old Testament. So who were these Judaizers in their church and what were they preaching? So in Revelation 9, on the fifth trumpet, it says, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God on their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh the man. And in those days shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. Now remember that 
the word Pharisee could be interpreted as sting. So was this a, a pharisaical doctrine or religion that stung these people? And I've spoken of in my previous videos that, you know, I believe that let's go forward to Revelation 13 and the beast of the earth. And I believe that the beast of the earth and the, is a lamb was actually Muhammad. And, you know, we have a lot of people get confused here with the man of perdition. And it doesn't say here that there's this man that rises up and he forces everyone to have the mark of the beast. It says that this lamb or this beast of the earth forces everybody to have the mark of the beast. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb and he spake as a dragon. So we know if you follow my channel, you know who I think the dragon is referring to. I believe it's the descendants of Herod and Esau or these Idumean people. And he exerciseth all power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. So this is the, the scripture that people get the man of perdition from. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword, and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he caused all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. So, um, you know, it's this lamb that looks like Jesus, looks like the the uh, the Lamb of God, but it speaks like a dragon. It has the voice of these Idumean Pharisees, basically. And I, I've just found some information out about Muhammad, which I knew, but it's more in depth, uh, about this early time of history when the Christian church was forming that basically Muhammad's wife was Catholic. And the man who interpreted his visions was her cousin. And they were both Nabataean, and I hope you go back and watch my information on the Nabataeans and that Herod was in fact half Nabataean and that the Nabataean people integrated with the Idumean or the e Edomite people in the Negev. Basically, she was a Nabataean merchant who was very rich. She was Roman Catholic. She had donated all her wealth to the Roman Catholic Church at the time. And, you know, if we look at this in terms of this scripture, we have the first beast out of the sea. We've got the, the Holy See, the Roman Church, the Roman political system out of the sea, out of the Mediterranean Sea. And it has seven heads and ten horns. Uh, as I said in my previous Videos about we have the little horn who I think were the Herods and, you know, there's information out there that the Herods actually took over the the role of emperor through Vespasian and Titus. I've, I've basically uh, shown through ancestry and uh, what can be found on that online that the Herods did integrate with Roman aristocracy. So we have this Roman Catholic system that is very pharisaical. And, you know, we've got this second beast who I think is Muhammad and is the Islamic religion because it, it speaks like a dragon. It's preaching the same doctrine and it's spewing forth its dragon water as the dragon did after the woman. 
and it's causing all these people in, at this time to convert or die just as Muhammad did and to receive a mark. Now, in my previous videos, I've spoken of that mark as being a tax. The people in this region, if they didn't convert, they had to pay a tax um, to this religion because they weren't part of it. You know, and we also have the Islamic religion wearing the name of Allah on their forehead and if they don't convert, they would lose their head or their hand. Uh, there's a good video here by the Unexpected Cosmology channel on YouTube, Muhammad and the Millennial Kingdom, um, and he goes into the information on Alberto Rivera, and it speaks of he speaks of how Muhammad's wife was a Roman Catholic, and that it was the Roman Catholic Church that basically formed the Islamic religion to control the people of this region. I'm just going to play some of uh, his videos. Uh, this is The Unexpected Cosmology on YouTube. Uh, please go and watch his video. I'm going to play his video because he's already done this research and uh, I simply don't have the time to go in and find it myself, but I have read it before in the past. Included within that issue, actually, it's this one right here. You can see right there, the prophet right there. <clears throat> Included within that issue is an excerpt from an interview given by Rivera, the, the former Jesuit whistleblower. In an effort to save the rainforest, you can read the entire thing for yourself on TUC. So there's a link right there. Uh, I put his entire interview up in an article. I will only be backing up the dump truck on a few select quotes such as the following. Another problem, so this is Rivera speaking here. Another problem was the true Christians in North Africa who preached the gospel. Roman Catholicism was growing in power, but would not tolerate opposition. Somehow the Vatican had to create a weapon to eliminate both the Jews and the true Christian believers who refused to accept Roman Catholicism. Looking to North Africa, they saw the multitude. He, he says over and over again without saying it, he's talking about the Nazarene, just so you know. It, it's so apparent he's talking about the Nazarene. But he doesn't want, like, he doesn't want to offend his uh, evangelical base. Looking to North Africa, they saw the multitudes of Arabs as a source of manpower to do their dirty work. Some Arabs had become Roman Catholic and could be used in reporting information to leaders in Rome. Others were used in an underground spy network, say what, to carry out Rome's master plan to control the, the great multitudes of Arabs who rejected Catholicism. When St. Augustine appeared on the scene, he knew what was going on. His monastery served as bases to seek out and destroy Bible manuscripts owned by the true Christians. Dang, I knew Augustine was a spook. And, and that there was a smoking gun poking out from underneath his alb. But this barrel is loaded. The RCC hosted an underground spy network via Augustine's monasteries. His missionary journeys in Britain, which I've talked about in the past, are finally making a whole lot more sense if they haven't already. He was trying to establish uh, spy networks in, you know, one of the places I, I say is ground zero for the millennial kingdom. Rivera, one of the, the plantings for Yasharel, Rivera even has Augustine destroying Bible manuscripts owned by the quote-unquote true Christians. That's a reference to the Nazarene. He guards his words carefully so as not to receive a loogie from the KJV only in 66 canon crew. I could take a sentence like that to mean Augustine was destroying Bibles in their language so that Latin was the law of the land, which is a possibility. But I'm thinking it's some of the lost books like the Gospel of the Hebrews, which we know was in the Nazarene's care, no longer exists except for a few select quotes, which was being chucked into the pyre. And of course, we have others like uh, the Book of the Illuminators, uh, which is given the authority of the Nazarene. That was another one of their books. And we only have that because, like, to our knowledge, like one copy survived. I mean, it's that dire. Like, Augustine did his work. He went around destroying. Then we have uh, the Gospel of Peter, which was another one. I, I, that was another one of the Nazarene 
uh, that we only have the Gospel of Peter, Bazar Kifa, it, not even a completed manuscript. And the only reason we have it is that it was found in the bones of a dead monk. He was buried with it to preserve it. He wanted to preserve it so bad, he made sure he was buried with it where nobody could find it, maybe dig it up years later. Setting up Augustine's monasteries as water cooler hangouts for spooks plays an important role in what Rivera claims next. The Vatican wanted to create a messiah for the Arabs, someone they could raise up as a great leader, a man with charisma whom they could train, and eventually unite all the non-Catholic Arabs behind him, creating a mighty army that would ultimately capture Jerusalem for the Pope. In the Vatican briefing, Cardinal Bia told us this story. A wealthy Arabian lady who was a faithful follower of the Pope played a tremendous part in this drama. She was a widow named Khadija. She gave her wealth to the church and retired to a covenant as a nun, but was given an assignment. She was to find a brilliant young man who could be used by the Vatican to create a new religion and become the Messiah for the children of Ishmael. Khadija had a cousin named uh, Waraqwa, who was also a very faithful Roman Catholic, and the Vatican placed him in a critical role as Muhammad's advisor. He had tremendous influence on Muhammad. The Vatican needed an Islam army to capture Jerusalem, but why not do it themselves? It's not like the official narrative deprives the Pope of fighting men. I'm not saying there wasn't a bloody conflict in Jerusalem during the kingdom of Mashiach via the Crusades, but my investigation has led me to conclude that Yehuda was purposely under, underdeveloped by the sons of Yashiro during the thousand years. As Revelation 18, 2 states, I already insinuated that time when I talked about how Jerusalem would be a haunt of unclean spirits and so on and so forth. And when we see what, what we call Tartaria, these buildings all over the world, we don't see them developed in the Holy Land. I mean, it, it was wasteland. It wasn't developed until the 1800s when all the, the churches and stuff started popping up. And you know, we see writings like uh, Mark Twain. He said he walked through them and it was just tumbleweeds. There was nothing there. And, um, and so, you know, obviously we can really question like, wait, what? Like you're fighting all these wars for the Holy Land. You're not even developing it. You're not even, it doesn't make any sense. Whatever, I digress. Rivera didn't have full disclosure, and I don't hold it against him. He's going with like a like a narrative framework that, you know, we're not working on that narrative framework anymore. I could very well see a finance fighting force against Mashiach, though. What better way to do that than create a second Messiah for the um, Arabs, Arabians? That's where Khadija bint Ku, uh, I'll mispronounce her last name, forgive me, uh, Khadija bint who Wilid steps onto the stage. We'll just call her Khadija. The mother of Islam was a wealthy 40-year-old widow when she married the 25-year-old Muhammad. She initially brought Muhammad on as an employee three years earlier in order that he might manage her affairs. But then Rivera clarifies she had already given her wealth to the RCC and retired to one of Augustine's world-famous uh, luxurious resorts, his monasteries. Muhammad was her assignment. Interesting to note, it was not Muhammad that proposed to Khadija, but Khadija to Muhammad. It was a huge, you know, I mean, given this culture and everything, that's a huge red flag right there. And that's uh, the official narrative, too. Way to rock the cradle, Khadija. In other news, history records that be she became the first woman Muslim while simultaneously overlooking the obvious. She was his handler. Muhammad began receiving divine revelations, and his wife's Catholic cousin, Raqwa, helped interpret them. How convenient. And that was another quote from uh, the former Jesuit, Rivera. Waraka um, Nafal is another fascinating character, not simply due to his relations with Khadija or because he played the part of his other handler, Muhammad's other handler, helping Muhammad to interpret his visions, wink, wink. Rivera claims he was a Roman spook. Did I not tell you that the Quran comes across like the rants and ravings of an MK Ultra victim? It really does. It's like his, his eyelids were like taped open or something too long. That is likely to get my head sawn off, but somebody out there needs to hear it before my Ruach meets Yahuwah. So here's another uh, quote from the uh, Quran from the book of Jonah. So if you, prophet, are in doubt about what we have revealed to you, 
ask those who have been reading the scriptures before you, Jonah 94. The Quran, the Quran has Allah telling the prophet to go to the people of the book and ask them how to interpret it. That's interesting. Because ask any former Catholic, reading the Bible for oneself is dangerous business. That quote really stood out to me during my Quran binge reading session. Many will interpret that passage to mean Muhammad was, was, was expected to interview Christians and Jews about scripture, but that's not how I take it at all. And I'm not the only one. The people whom Allah assigned as Muhammad's fact checkers were likely Khadija and uh, Warqwa. And I think that's who he's talking about there. Uh, go out, he's, he, it's, it's Allah telling the prophet, go ask the people who I have allowed to interpret the book for you. So basically anything in the, the Torah, the Tanakh, and the New Testament, you have to interpret it through your two handlers. And whatever they say, that's what it means. That's what that passage means. Well, get this then. I checked. Warqwa was an Ibionite priest. I couldn't believe it when I read that. Um, are you remotely aware of who the Ebionites were? The Ebionites followed the Torah of Yahuwah while proclaiming Yahusha as Mashiach. Many of them rejected the teachings of Paul as well, holding strictly to vegetarian diets, like that pipe and smoke on it. Augustine's, so I threw that out for the anti-Paul crowd, because we all know that the Ebionites were famously, apparently, very anti-Paul. And so you here you have one of Muhammad's two handlers was an anti-Paul, vegetarian, Ebionite priest, followed the Torah, uh, and kept Yahushua HaMashiach as, uh, kept Yahushua as, as Mashiach, apparently. Augustine's agents had infiltrated the Ebionites. That confirms everything that Rivera had been claiming regarding the true church, because the Ebionites had their own scripture apart from the Roman Catholic, uh, canon as well. In Augustine's day, the Ebionites and the Nazarene and everyone else opposing the RCC, yes, I even include the Gnostics in this, were probably all infiltrated in top management. So, you know, the, the biggest, uh, you see the biggest propaganda is being pushed against the Nazarene, the Ebionites, and the Gnostics. So I'll just leave it there, and I want to go on to some information on the Ebionites. So I know it's not the Ebionites, but, you know, we have all these different uh, sects or groups around uh, at this time, in the early centuries after Jesus. And, you know, we have the Manich uh, Manichaeism. And I've done a video on Buddhism and, you know, during this time we have the Manichaeus who entered into Asia and I believe this is where the early Buddhist teaching came from and, and it was a, a corporate, it was incorporating Gnosticism and Christian uh, Zoroastrian teachings. It says Manichaeism was, was quick, Manichaeism was quickly successful and spread far through Aramaic speaking regions. It thrived between the third and seventh centuries and at its height was one of the most widespread religions in the world. Manichaean churches and scriptures is, existed as far east as the Han Dynasty and as far west as the Roman Empire. It was briefly the main rival to early Christianity. Manichaeism has survived longer in the east than it did in the west, although it was thought to have finally faded away after the 14th century in South China. So, um, you know, Mano was an Iranian born 216 in the near in Iraq, basically. Um, so it's his Manichaean painting of the Buddha Jesus it depicts Jesus Christ as a Manichaean prophet. The figure can be identified as a representation of Jesus Christ by the small gold cross that sits on the red lotus throne in his left hand. So we've got Jesus depicted as Buddha here by the Manichaeans. So it says here in Central Asia, some Sogdians in Central Asia, in Central Asia believed in the religion. In China, in the east it spread along trade routes as far as Chang'an, the capital of Tang, China. After Tang Dynasty, some Manichaean groups participated in peasant movements. The religion 
was used by many rebel leaders to mobilize followers. In Song and Yan, China, remnants of Manichaeism contributed to sects such as the Red Turbans during the Song dynasty. The Manichaeans were derogatorily referenced by the Chinese as meaning they abstained from meat and worshipped demons. So they were vegetarians. An account in Fozu Tongji, an important historiography of Buddhism in China compiled by Buddhist scholars during 1258 to 1269 says that the Manichaeans worshipped the white Buddha. So what does this mean? And their leader wore violet headgear while followers wore white costumes. Many Manichaeans took part in rebellions against the Song government and were eventually quelled. After that, all governments were suppressive against Manichaeism and his followers. So we've got this early, you know, uh, Gnostic sort of Christian Zoroastrian religion in China and they're wearing white, you know, a lot of Buddhists wear white. So in, this is, to me, where Buddhist religion originated and basically it's a corruption of the story of Jesus. So it's saying uh, Manai, the third century Babylonian sage, so, you know, this is linked to these Babylonian groups. Manai consciously blended aspects of Gnostic Christianity, Persian Zoroastrian and Buddhism to create a new religion which might be acceptable in both the East and West. You know, maybe combining the Gnostic Christianity and Zoroastrianism actually created the Buddhism because they did go East. And just check out my video on the history of Buddhism. They also had weird food beliefs. Basically it says here that um, he provides a riveting account of the diet of the Manichae elect. They believe that certain fruits contain trapped particles of the divine which could be released by consumption and digestion with the result that, as Augustine puts it, the Manichae fruit eater would breathe out angels or bring up bits of God. Now we've got Augustine popping up here again. So yeah, we have the video talking about Augustine being instrumental in the uh, early Islamic religion and Muhammad. Now I know the Manichaeans aren't the Ebionites. Let's roll up here. But you know, were they uh, eventually, as it says here, corrupted and uh you know we have this early buddhist religion forming here as well as the islamic religion ibnites believe that jesus was a jewish messiah and he wasn't and he wasn't divine at birth but was chosen by god to sacrifice himself to redeem humanity's sins because he was unusually righteous and followed the hundreds of jewish laws to the letter the so marcionites rejected jewish law an Old Testament teaching and believed in two gods, the Jewish God who created the canon of law that were impossibly difficult for humanity to keep and made them miserable, and two, Christ, an unrelated individual who freed humanity from the grasp of the Jewish God. The sect was popular in Asia Minor. Followers were attracted by its emphasis on love and salvation rather than judgment, punishment, and damnation. So I don't know. Did you know, this Augustine crossover, was Augustine a Herod? Here's a tangent. We've got George Augustine Washington. Interesting family history. Here on Augustine's uh, Wikipedia profile, it says, according to contemporary Jerome, Augustine established a new and ancient faith. In his youth, he was drawn to Manichaean faith and later to the Hellenistic philosophy of Neoplatonism after his conversion to Christianity and baptism in 386, Augustine developed his own approach to philosophy and theology. And it says that it says that he was uh, of North African. So when you know that's very different than it is today, North Africa back in those days. A uh, uh, family of Berbers. He may have been an Arab. And they were from the Aurelius. Roman family name. So does that mean he's related to the emperor of Rome, Marcus Aurelius? Perhaps. Marcus Aurelius Flavius Claudius Gothicus. You know, there's a family name there, Aurelius. Sabinus. 
Titus Flavius Patronus. I think this is a yeah, polio. This is a Herod line. Thapsania polia, Titus Flavius Sabinus. So, yeah, I mean, this Aurelius name is tied in with the, Fer the Herod family, family name. Vespasiana Pola. Marcus Titus Flavius, Emperor of Rome, Vespasian. So, this is the Vespasian family line. Yeah, so go and watch this video. You know, I'm kind of borrowing from it to save time. Um, it's really good information on uh, the origins of the Islamic faith. And, you know, as I've started out with the information on the leaven, we've got Paul here talking about the dangers of the Judaiz Judaizers. From their churches, leaven here symbolizes wrong teaching that destroys true Christianity. Revelation 12, the woman persecuted. Now then the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth. Uh, this is in 70 AD when the city of Jerusalem was destroyed. He persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman. So, you know, all these Arabs from this region, uh, the people who drank up the false religions, Buddhism, Islam, Roman Catholicism, and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So, you know, as I've said in my other videos, a lot of these uh, seals have been broken and the trumpets have been blown we are now in the time of the little season of satan or the dragon the devil and uh you know these particular people who have orchestrated this in the past are now in charge of our world and they're having their little season their family bloodlines the serpent seed the aristocracy and the banking and Roman Catholic Church elite. But it's not just the Roman Catholic Church, it, it goes into other religions as well. As Muhammad was married into Nabataean elite and Petra was the original Mecca. Uh, this is all over, the, uh, over YouTube, check it out. Uh, Petra was not in... Saudi Arabia, it was in the Negev, in in the city of Petra. That's the original Mecca. And Herod's family were also Nabataean. Uh, this is also all over the internet. Herod the Great, his father was... Herod was born in 72 BC in Ijumea, or Edom, south of Judea son of Antipater the Egemean, so he was an Edomite, and his mother was Cypros, a Nabataean princess. And, you know, his sister, Salome I, was the sister of Herod the Great, was mother of Bernice by her husband Costabaris, governor of Egemea. So the Costabaris the Costabarian Herods and Salome had two children, Bernice and Antipater, by her marriage to Aristobulus ben Herod. Bernice united the Costabarian and Hasmonean Scions of the Herodians. The descendants of the two principals included two kings of Judea, Herod Agrippa, Agrippa the first son, Agrippa the second. So, you know, we've got uh, all this uh, other lineage of the Herods. So again, back to Mark 12, the Pharisees, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? Then they sent him some of the Pharisees and the Herodians. So they're in cahoots together to catch him in his words. So again, we've got the Pharisees and the Herodians linked together. 
So again, just to remind us, sorry, Mark 8, 11, and the Pharisees, it says, Jesus tells us, take heed, beware the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. Thanks for listening, everyone.